Isaiah 59 from verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. I'll, write, I'll say it again. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Let it be a, a word in season. Let it be a word that will minister. Lord, that you would be glorified, that every life can find some truth to take home today and make live, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Three things here. A fear, a flood, and a flag. A standard. A fear, a flood, and a flag. This verse we could take to heart as a challenge for us to return to simple Christianity that's lived out, that's evident, that's relevant in the everyday. So shall they fear the name of the Lord. It tells us of a holy God. A God who is holy. And that should make a difference for us in our discipleship, in our radical faith, in our everyday life. He's made it possible for us to live this life, this Christian life that is talked about here. It's not just theory, it's reality. It can be. It can be in your everyday, in this 21st century, in this nation, in this city where you live and work and go about your day by day. This truth, as we said earlier, it's eternal. It doesn't change. It's forever. And the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is a truth that we should take stock of and think about and it should make a difference. Where is the fear of the Lord? Are we afraid? Are we ashamed? In view of the judgment to come, as our brother was saying before, people trembling at the word. Do we see that? Not too often. Or if we see it, they don't follow through with it as they ought to, as we ought to. Perhaps it's time that we ought to regain a sense of that. A sense of that. The fear of the Lord. Where has the fear of the Lord gone? In these days of apostasy, of a turning away from Him, a turning away from truth, where we see a church full of unconverted people. Talking of the church worldwide, that could be the case even in this building today. You might be an unconverted person, and yet a faithful, faithful churchgoer, yet unsaved, hellbound. God forbid that you should be toying with God on the brink of a Christless eternity, that you should toy with it and think light of it and act carelessly with it. Yet this church goes today toying and thinking light of sin, of service, of sanctification. Revelation 4.11 it says that we have been made, created to please Him for His good pleasure, for His pleasure. That's our true purpose for living. Where the rubber hits the road, that's where He wants us to be. To honour Him, to glorify Him. The fear of the Lord. Our Lord says in John 15, 5, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing, He says. Absolutely nothing. And yet we go about even our Christian life with sometimes not enough thought to what God is saying. What does God want for my life? What is God saying to me? You know, I'm encouraged when, when folk tell me that the Lord's impressed something on their heart. You know, they've prayerfully sought Him about something and they're saying, God is leading me this way. It's not just their own thinking or deciding or their own volition, but they want God to lead and guide and direct and to him, for Him to be glorified. The fear of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. Do we truly recognise Him and our need of Him? Apart from me, without me, He says, you can do nothing, not one thing. Do we realise our reliance upon Him that we need to have, that we ought to have? Our reason for being is Him. He is that, our reason for being. Where has the fear of the Lord gone? Where has biblical preaching gone? 
is absent, it's missing, <coughs> sadly lacking. God's design has been abandoned. The Word of God has been neglected. The centrality of it. And as a nation, as a nation, we are erring. We're like those in Isaiah 3.12 where it says, of God's people, of Israel, Isaiah 3.12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. Australia is erring. It's an erring nation. We have witnessed a defection from the truth. We're seeing churches run by women, pastors. It's not in here. It's not scriptural that they even preach. And people are looking at the church and they're questioning what's going on. The fear of the Lord is gone. The relevance of Christianity is tainted. It's been doctored. It's been defected from such that it's not real anymore. It's not scriptural anymore. Biblical Christianity is uh, lacking, uh, is sadly missing in many quarters. And instead we have, amongst the people of God, a casual attitude. A casual attitude to spiritual matters. A worldly approach where it's worldly methodologies are coming in and overtaking, where we're trifling with the holy things. Will we be a God-fearing people? A God-honouring people? A Bible-believing and Bible-practicing people. Christians, we have stopped thinking like a Christian. It's like the mindset, the world view has been changed. That we've been subliminally uh, conditioned and our minds warped into the ways of the world such that we can't see that it's wrong anymore. What a reproach. What a reproach. And the church is compromised, it's softened, it's weakened. We have become neutralised. I'm talking of the church worldwide. That the church is becoming neutralised. It's becoming effeminate, neutered, sterile. And I think it's a reproach on the church's... I'm not meaning to bash other churches per se, but it's a sign of the times, isn't it? When you have churches, including bishops and archbishops and whatever else they've got, Women rule over them. Where are the men? Where are the men who will stand and deliver? Where are the men? It's a reproach. It's a, uh, it's a reproach for the men <coughs> that they have become so weak and effeminate. And truth is under attack. It's under attack today. We're in the midst of a truth war where we see the fad driven church, the market driven church the fast asleep church, and the church in many quarters has given up the fight. It's conformed, it's tolerant, it's in defeat, it's in retreat. Whereas we should be earnestly contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. The fear of the Lord, of His name, of His glory. We see that today, that it's lacking. And we see secondly the flood, the flood that is pouring in and overtaking and overwhelming. Where the enemy will come in like a flood, we're told. The enemy does not rest. Whilst the church can be asleep, the enemy does not rest. We see the rising spirit of Antichrist at work today in the world system. Our world flooded, besotted. Its values warped. Its wisdom is madness. We're told in the word, learn not the way of the heathen. We don't need to learn the way of the heathen. Now that's not to say everything that the world makes or invents or creates or undertakes is wrong. But we're not to get absorbed and overtaken with it. But we do, don't we? We do. We read, redeem the time because the days are evil. Do we? Do we? Truly? Redeem the time. Make use of it. Our world, it's besotted, it's, it's a nation. As our newly, uh, as our new Prime Minister Julia Gillard has said, Ms. Julia Gillard has said of our national government lately, they've lost their way. So true. The Australian nation has lost its way. Lost its way. We have pride, yes. 
gay pride. They call it. National pride. Yet yeah, our nation should be humbled. Humbled. And I'm not meaning to get political here or bash anybody in particular. And Woe that I should uh, speak evil of dignitaries, but I'm just quoting a man here. A man called Kevin Rudd. He says he is proud. He's proud. Proud, proud, proud. About mm. all the things he has done and achieved. Maybe some of them are good things. I'm not saying they're not. Not all. Not all good, not all bad, necessarily. But I thought it was noteworthy that in his farewell uh, as uh, our outgoing Prime Minister, he gives thanks. He gives thanks to his God. I think it would be a God with a little g. He says that he gives thanks to the great God and creator of us all. That sounds quite okay. I could, mm -hmm. I could go along with that. I thank him or her as well. A reproach, brothers and sisters. A shame. A shame. A shame. Proud. I am proud. I give thanks to the great God and creator of us all. I thank him or her as well. No wonder we have lost our way. No wonder. No wonder our nation our nation, known for its pride, its apathy, its indifference, its godlessness. And our new PM, Merz, Julia Gillard, you know, she's living with a man who's not her husband. She says, I believe a lot in her speeches. I believe, but she is described as an inactive Baptist. Others say she's an atheist. She describes, is described as an atheist. Now we can pray for our Prime Minister, as we have done, and as we ought to. We ought to pray for her and the opposition for any government of any level and pray that God will help and undertake. And uh, as we know, they're appointed by God. Ultimately, He has allowed them their appointment. And yet, our nation, a flood, inundating it, a flood. It's hurtful. It's damaging. It's destructive of the worldliness. And the world is in the church now. It's intertwined such that you can scarcely separate the two. There's scarcely any difference from the church and the world. And a believer is meant to be separate. Separate from the world. Have nothing in common with it. The world, this world that does not love Christ, it really rejects him. As much as it may pay some token uh, to the great God and creator of us all. It does not know him, the God of the Bible, some God of man's invention, of man's imagination. Friends, we must plead and pray for our nation. Plead and pray. I quote, This generation has made a God of its own, small g. The effeminate deity of the modern school is no more the true God than Dagon or Baal. I know him not, neither do I reverence him. But Jehovah is the true God. He is the God of love, but he is also robed in justice. He is the God of forgiveness, but he is also the God of atonement. He is the God of heaven, but he is also the God who sends the wicked down to hell. We, of course, are thought to be harsh and narrow-minded and bigoted. Nevertheless, this God is our God forever and ever. There has been no change in Jehovah. He has revealed himself more clearly in Christ Jesus. But he is the same God as in the Old Testament. And as such, we worship him. That's Charles Spurgeon. Narrow-minded, bigoted. God is our God forever and ever. Do we worship him or do we worship the Dagon? And the Baal, the gods of the heathen, the gods of the nation of Australia. Do we worship him? Do we honour him? Do we honour the Lord's day? Will we honour him? Another quote from Billy Sunday. It would be a godsend if the church would suffer persecution today. She hasn't suffered it for hundreds of years. She is growing rich and lagging behind, going back. 
Oh, for persecution to come. Maybe that should be our prayer. Maybe that should be your prayer. That would shake us, wouldn't it? That would shake and sift us, wouldn't it? To see who would stand then. It's easy enough to attend church now. What then? What then? The fear of God. The flood of evil. And thirdly, the flag. The standard of the Spirit. Where you need to ask the Lord that He would raise up the flag. Raise up the banner. Raise up the standard by His Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit. We need the standard. The standard lifting, lifting up. It says there that the enemy will come like a flood. But the Lord, by His Spirit, uh, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against Him. The standard, the banner of the cross, lifted up, lifted high. Oh, that we could have that, brothers and sisters. That the Spirit of God would lift up a standard against the enemy. That breath of fresh air, that holy refining fire, that move of God, that the church of God would plead, would pray, would repent. That God would visit us and heal our land by His tender mercies. That the day spring from on high would visit us. The very glory of God in the person of Christ. That we'd regain our sense, our dire need of Him. That our soul thirst would be, again, something that would move us to wait upon Him. Psalm 62, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From Him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be greatly moved. My soul waiteth, waiteth, waiteth upon God. Does it? Does it for you? Does your soul wait upon Him? Church, that we might pray to be filled with Him. Filled with His Spirit. Filled with His Word. To be Christians who care. Who care about faithfulness. Who care about relationship with God who hunger, who thirst for truth to be filled with it. As Jeremiah 15, 16, he says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me as the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. It's Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Oh, for Christians who will... Raise the standard. Raise the standard. Who will uphold the truth, the unvarnished truth, the eternal truth, and condemn error. These are desperate days. Days that... Days are filled with compromise. Days that we should have conviction. Days for truth. Who will be brave? Who will rise up? For me against the evildoers. Who will be brave, if need be, to face pain? To face persecution, to face suffering, to face trials, to face loss. Will you join that army? I'm uh, reminded of an explorer who invited people to join the expedition. And uh, he uh, listed all of the hardships and the tragedy and, and the peril that faced them. And that was his advert, to come and join me. You know, Christ mm. says, come and follow me. Come, take your cross and follow me. Come and tread that path with me. The pathway to the cross. Mm. Will we? What will it matter in this, uh, of this present world 100 years from now? We won't care about global warming if there is such a <laughs> thing then. What, what will happen 10,000 years from now uh, as to what you've done with your life now? Mm -hmm. Now is the now that you have. It's the time that you have is the now. What will it matter then? It will matter what we did on earth in the now. While we had the, the earthly feet to walk with mm -hmm. and the earthly tongue to speak with. Mark 10, 29, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life Amen. where are the Christians Christians who care about sound doctrine about godly fellowship Christians who have the same mind the same love the standard raised Christians 
who desire the truth to declare it, to live it, to lay down their lives for it. Christians who will get a burden. This is a faith that works. It's a doable thing. Christianity is doable. It's a faith that works. It's a faith that lives. Someone said, live so that when you tell someone you are a Christian, it confirms their suspicions instead of surprising them. Amen. What about you and your workplace? Would it surprise them if you were to say you were a Christian? Or would it confirm their suspicions of you? A standard raised where we will see churches filled with godly, safe people. And where sinners come, they'll be coming to respond with conviction, with conversion. That we would plead for God to bring that to us. Yet, it's the case at times where churches are filled with lost people and there's no intention of them being saved and of the gospel being preached to them. It's like someone said, never try to teach a pig to sing. All you get is frustrated and it really annoys the pig. You know, you can't teach a pig to sing. You can try, but it's just going to annoy the pig. And likewise, it's trying to uh, get a sinner to live a Christian life without being born again first. It's like mm. teaching a pig to sing. Sometimes we, I know we've done that in the past with uh, some of our uh, youth outreach. We're trying to get them to live the Christian life, but they're not Christians yet. No. So it's uh, almost a, it's back to front, isn't it, mm. brothers and sisters? And we need to preach the gospel and urge people to trust Him. To have our frame of reference made by the Word. Reframed. God's Word. That it live in us. Is Christianity for you a way of life? Or a Sunday Christianity only? Is it mere ritual or tradition? Or perhaps maybe just a satisfying of your conscience. Oh, I've done my Christian thing for the week. I've been to church for an hour and a half. I've given time and attention to the things of God. It's just to satisfy your conscience. But you're not really living the life. Friends, don't make that mistake. As someone said, I'm, I'm closing... As Christians, we know there is a literal hell, a lake of fire where the unsaved will burn for all eternity. Therefore, we should act upon this truth without reservation and go out and declare the word to where the sinners are. How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? He's sending you. Go and preach. Go and declare it. <laughs> This quote, for so long we have allowed Satan to invade our communities through our mortuaries, the entertainment, the pornography industries, religious institutions, sexually perverse establishments, homosexual parades, and other sin celebrations without a word from the Christian therein. God has called us to cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgression. Isaiah 58. Friends, Australia is going to hell. It's a nation ruined and damned. A godless nation. This is no Christian nation. <coughs> Far from it. A nation of sin-loving people with a desensitization towards sin. A nation headed for destruction. Just a, an aside, I received this news from the Christian Democratic Party and they urge the electorate with some telling words, let me quote in part the coming election could spell the end of Christian freedoms and values in Australia yeah. the upcoming federal election could be a watershed in Australia's history particularly when it comes to our Christian freedom and values Opinion polls indicate that the Greens are on the ascendancy and if as predicted they gain the balance of power in the Senate and possibly even win some lower house seats 
they will undoubtedly use their power to push their anti-Christian agenda. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Bob Brown is a practicing homosexual. Senator Bob Brown. Yeah. I mean, Senator, um, what's the other lady called? Oh, uh, the Wong. Yeah, Senator Penny Wong. She's ALP. Senator Penny Wong of the ALP is a is a light lesbian. And uh, Senator Bob Brown, he runs the, Bob, the, the, the Green Party. And the quote goes on, in the event of a hung parliament, they could be in a position to determine who forms government. And both major parties would be under intense pressure to accommodate their demands. Now listen to this, this, are, this is their stated policies. I'm just stating facts here today. You make your choice accordingly and I'm not telling you how to vote. But this is the policies of the Greens. They want to remove prayers from all Australian parliaments. They promote same-sex marriage. They want to remove scripture classes from state schools in those schools that still have them. They promote euthanasia and other anti-life policies. They want to remove chaplains from state schools. They promote same-sex adoption and surrogacy. They want to remove exemptions from uh, religious organisations and equal opportunity and employment legislation. So in other words, Christian schools won't be able to um, refuse someone who uh, academically might fit the bill. And friends, this is uh, what's going on today. <coughs> if you want to have more info, have a look at that later. But this is what is going on. Australia is at a watershed. And uh, we know that our nation is very on a knife edge, I would say, in terms of... of the danger it is in, as it is rejecting that fear of God, it's proud, 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 proud. Mm. When it should be a shame, a shame, a shame. Mm. When it should have a reproach and a sense of conviction and a, an urging to repentance, it is proud. A nation in a critical condition needs a church in a <coughs> biblical condition. A nation in a critical condition needs a church in a biblical condition. Mm -hmm. Friends, we need to recognise the fear of God, the glory of God, the name of God, to see the flood that inundates us. It's deepening daily. Australia, you're standing in it. We're flooded by evil. And we need a biblical restoration, a restoration of biblical truth and practice, not just knowing it and, and uh, <coughs> voicing Bible truth and doctrine, but living it, practicing it. Oh,